David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Thursday, March 11th, 2021. Ready for another show? It doesn't matter. I always ask that question, but it never matters. Uh, time marches on. And uh, as I understand it, we'll be marching on to daylight savings time before next week's programs. This is uh, today and tomorrow. I guess the last ones on uh, standard time because, of course, it's like early March. And what better time to pretend it's summer than right now? I am not certain why we're doing this. I, and uh, it's been a hot topic again for whatever reason on Twitter the last couple of days. Uh, people tweeting in support and or opposition to the idea of uh, either just doing away with daylight savings time entirely, either by uh, sticking with standard time, a very unpopular position, or slightly more popular, the idea of simply getting rid of standard time and making daylight time uh, the standard time. But problems with both, and uh, one of the reasons that we do this stupid thing, I don't know why we do it the days that we do it. I, they've been moving the uh, daylight savings switch up earlier in the year recently and uh i don't know if they i think they've been moving they've been moving the the switch back to standard time up as well or or back further i i don't know whether anything is happening with that one but uh but yes lots of people grousing about the idea of if i guess apparently if we went with daylight savings time year round in the winter we'd be uh driving to work in the dark but then this might have been a good year to try and do that because no one was driving to work not no one but uh, far fewer of us anyway. And uh, interesting thought now about heading into a post-COVID future, thinking about uh, what it will be like for people to head back to work. We were just talking here last night about uh, what would it take to get the uh, to get us, uh, ourselves personally, or, or uh, our fellow Americans, if you will, actually the whole world, to go back to work, to go back to the office, to go back to restaurants. I mean, I guess going back to the office is a matter of your boss saying, come back to the office. Uh, though, yeah, I, I suppose in some places they will still be um, somewhat sensitive to what the employees actually feel comfortable with, but not in most places. But yeah, restaurants, question mark uh, about that, I guess. And I was just sort of trying to think of what would be the metrics of that. My wife was asking me about that. What what would we be looking for? I assume, I assume for us, it would probably take some guidance from the state saying, uh, well, okay, restaurants ought to be back open again, whether at 50% capacity or 100%, I don't know whether that would make much of a difference. We saw yesterday Maryland changing its guidelines. That may change again. I'm not sure. But even if they said restaurants could be open 100% and I was vaccinated, uh, yeah, I mean, the real question is, would I, how would I vote with my feet, as Greg puts it? Would I say, I know I'm permitted to go back there, but am I going to do it? Will I ever feel comfortable with it again? You know, knowing what I know now about how the whole time we were in restaurants before, everybody was breathing all over you and your food and you were inhaling it and... You, the fact that you didn't come away sick was just a lucky break that there wasn't the novel coronavirus circulating at the time. And uh, now that the experts predict that uh, we'll probably run into such novel viruses all the time as humans expand into uh, previously wild habitat, etc. Well, OK, I don't know. How long will it take for those viruses to get to the restaurant I'm in? Uh, OK, uh, I'm not sure. It's going to it's gonna take a lot of getting used to. The idea that we shouldn't be in masks and shouldn't worry about breathing all over each other again. But, uh, well, the day is coming. It's just not here yet. And uh, neither is my vaccine. Still have to wait another day until I get the first round of that. And uh, I'll be interested to see. Now, I, I heard yesterday as we were, as we made our final decision to say, all right, I'm not going to be waiting around for the one shot thing from Johnson & Johnson. Sounded like a good idea when they had some on hand now they don't have any and it's going to be well to get it but i understand the president has announced the uh, uh procurement of another hundred million is that right doses i don't know some enormous amount of doses of the j 
Johnson and Johnson vaccine uh, procurement here, meaning uh, will promise to give you money later if you make the vaccine starting now. But I don't know when they deliver the stuff, but uh, it's good news. And that's what it's going to take to get the bulk of everybody who's spreading the virus, whether they get sick from it or not vaccinated so that there's less of it in the air and you can go back to the restaurants and just think all that's on me is that guy's bad breath not every germ he's ever carried in his life looking forward to that day greg dworkin is here with news on that front i am sure plus others lots going on today catch you up on what's happening in congress what's not happening there good morning greg how are you good morning i'm just fine okay Uh, i'm mid shot you know uh a couple of weeks right, after right. my first and a couple of weeks before my second, because uh, I did the Moderna thing. Yeah, we're going to talk about Johnson & Johnson. We're going to talk about uh, 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 persuasion and, and hesitancy and all sorts of stuff. Oh, yeah. But uh, really although I had things in my head prepared that yeah, I was going to talk to about. To hell with that. I just got distracted by this tweet. So, you know, oh. uh, we're professionals. Do not do this at home. Actually, we're not professionals and do not right. do this at home. If but squirrels uh, Brad ever Moss, figure out Twitter, uh, who it. is uh, one of the lawyers that protects whistleblowers, along with Mark ah, Zaid, okay. uh, very active on Twitter, noted that uh, Thomas Caldwell of Virginia, you've heard of Virginia. Uh, oh, yeah. Not Thomas Caldwell. I don't think it's one of the better known uh, states. One of the originals. Sure. Uh, accused U.S. Right Capitol guess. insurrectionist Thomas Caldwell of Virginia ah. defends his purchase of a gun disguised as a cell phone, otherwise <laughs> known as a cell phone gun, uh, before Gen 6 it? saying it's legal and he needed it to ward off the Karens. The Karens. Oh, the. Oh, OK. All right. I was like, right. What is it? Spelling the, it this is what the C-A-R-R-O-N. legal briefing said. And I, I was reading this and shaking my head. The court respectfully huh. was misinformed about the purpose of the cell phone gun. The gun's a legal firearm under the Gun Control Act and can be bought like any other firearm. Sure. It's a surprisingly yes. popular gun among individuals like Caldwell who have concealed <laughs> carry permits. Oh, okay. It's That's locally sort of. known as the anti-Karen gun, a reference to citizens with a predisposition to quickly dial 911 at the drop of a hat. In other words, mm. the purpose of the gun is to avoid having police unnecessarily called by concerned citizens who are unaccustomed to concealed permit holders lawfully carrying a firearm which is quite common in rural oh, areas okay. like the area of residence. I see. that. All right, that unravels it a little bit. I mean, it's dumb, but now I get you because I was right. like, well, what does that do to prevent so it's not, Karenism? It's not, it's not to be used against Karens. Sorry, it's to Karen. be hidden from Karens. Yes, so the Karen, I, I have not, uh, I mean, I guess if I were more into gun culture, I might have found out about stories about Karens calling cops because guns. I haven't really heard those. It's usually... I'm calling cops because someone wants to make me wear a mask or right. someone. Well, that's an enormously lemonade. thin paperback. Yeah. Uh, right. True. I guess you could go with that one too. Mine. Uh, yeah. Oh, I bought a, uh, by the way, a uh, AR-15 that looks like a an iPad. That's the only way you can describe disguise it these days. It's just a very long iPad, sir. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> very long, long iPad with a trigger, right? Yeah. It's an iPad. So anyway. Uh, what do they call it? Plus, max. Yeah, Pro. I, 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 I couldn't What's help the it suffix next now? But, but what Humongous. I really wanted to talk about it, you know, some election stuff and polls. And, okay. Oh you know, yeah, well, I remember on. those. And then we'll get to, uh, and then we'll get to uh, uh, vaccines. All right. But very new CBS News poll today because uh, one leads to the other. All right. The COVID relief package is popular. Yes. And again, no, we we discussed this earlier in the week. COVID relief package. They didn't say stimulus. Good for them. Bloomberg says stimulus. Uh, they're financial and some of paper. the economic reporters say stimulus. The conservatives are calling it stimulus, but uh-huh. it's a COVID relief package. And the reason they don't want to call it a COVID relief package is because that's popular. Ah. It The message is that that's for you. I see. And we'll get to you. And uh, the person that's most upset about that is Mitch McConnell, who keeps telling uh-huh. reporters this is terrible. And uh, it's horrible that uh, there's going to be an economic boom and Biden's going to try to take credit for it when, in yeah. fact, it's stuff we made possible before he was even elected. I dare you uh, to call it you know, Biden. And, and in other words, uh, uh, McConnell's already anticipating this is popular and he's trying to, to uh, pre-message what's going on here, whereas Biden is saying, I'm not having any of that. I'm having a speech to the nation and I'm going to go around and tell people I did this and it's good. I don't have to have my name on the checks the way Trump did. I don't it sell could. my brand. 
I'm telling you, this is good. And let me tell you all the good things. And we, we went over, you and Joan did that on Tuesday. I did that a little bit yesterday. But this CBS News poll says most give Biden good marks for handling the outbreak. Approve of Congress passing the COVID relief package. Democrats, 94 percent. Independents, 77 percent. Even Republicans, 46. So overall, it's a 75 percent approval. And as President Joe Biden prepares to address the nation, two thirds of Americans give him positive marks for his handling of the outbreak. 67 percent say he's doing a good job. All right. Now, here's what's interesting His overall job rating is 60. But the slide I found most interesting is they asked an interesting question. Now, this is yeah, opinion. Interesting answer. But remember, this is a hard audience to convince. This is a tough crowd. OK. Uh-huh. And the question is, vaccine distribution in your state is moving too slowly, the right speed or too quickly. February compared to mm-hmm. now, that is okay. to say last month. And in February, 61 percent said it's moving too slowly. Now that's down to 47 all right. Thirty one percent said it was the right speed. That's up to forty three. And interestingly, February, eight hmm. percent said it was too quick and nine percent <laughs> say that. Now, I don't know who the too quickly people are. I presume they're diehard Republicans. Oh, uh, maybe. Yeah. Uh, but it's just like a weird thing to respond. If you don't want to get it, don't get it. I, and the yeah, funny thing is, as I noted yesterday on, on Twitter, the very same people who are complaining that this vaccine is ridiculous and it's all a fraud and I don't want to do it and nobody in their right mind would ever get this vaccine. And by the way, why are you sending this to other countries? Mm. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. Right. Like the old uh, food is terrible and the portions are so small. Exactly right. You know, and so you look at that and you scratch your head and say, okay, these are not people that I'm really trying to get on my side. Mm. Uh, So uh, speaking of trying to get on your side, here's a piece from Paul Kane in uh, uh, the Washington Post, Biden's party line approach in Congress has worked so far. Oh, my gosh. They're actually acknowledging right. it worked. OK, but Senator Joe Manchin wants bipartisanship. Angus King also, by the way, said uh, we're doing infrastructure next and that's big, but you got to pay for at least part of it. No. Maybe we should like tax the rich a little bit or something. You know, okay. so that's 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 the big give that progressives are going to have to do. OK, we're all right with that. But as far as what Paul Kane wrote, gone will be the party line approach that marked the first 50 days of Biden's presidency. Remember, he's not at 100 days yet. So all you people judging his first 100 days, you know, you're half cocked, yes. replaced by the more traditional method of requiring bipartisan buy in to clear the Senate's 60 vote filibuster hurdle. At least that's how S- Senator Joe Manchin the most outspoken Democrat defending the filibuster has mandated that things should go throughout the spring and summer. I haven't seen an effort by any of our leadership to sit down and work with them. Uh, so he was criticizing Schumer for no outreach to McConnell. Just make the effort. Make a little bit more of an effort with him and Mitch McConnell and make an effort with Thune and Blunt. I hate to see Roy leaving. These are all good people. I mean, Manchin was following up on comments he made Sunday on Meet the Press, it indicated he might support a proposal to force a talking filibuster. Okay. I mean, they're holding the or votes as, in the as same Trump place. Imagine likes right? to say, why do you people keep asking me about this? Well, because uh, it's important and because you're a roadblock. Yeah. So interesting, the, the, the demand for outrage. Like, we're voting in the same place. He knows where to find us, right? Like, he right, could right. come and so, vote, yes. so we'll get to that uh, okay. because you're absolutely okay. right. With those comments from Manchin, hmm. smart Democrats and anti-filibuster activists know – that any chance at repealing the filibuster will take many more months to spend the Senate split 50-50. And what Manchin's looking for, said Dick Durbin, is, is Republican buy-in, participation. I'm all for that. If there's one bill that should do it, it's infrastructure. Yes. Okay. So go. Now, Schumer on CNN linked the Republican $600 billion proposal to the 2009 American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARA, which was reduced to roughly $800 billion at the insistence of three moderate Republicans who provided the crucial votes for its passage. Mm. Collins was part of that mistake. We cut back on the stimulus dramatically. We stayed in recession for five years. What was offered by the Republicans was so far away from what was needed and so far away from what Biden proposed. And Collins took great offense of that mm. because she voted for the ARA bill. Yeah, well, it's her fault. Okay. And yeah. Brian Boitler points out any bill that Democrats need Collins to vote for will almost always almost certainly require nine others. Mm-hmm. And yes. she has no power to produce them. Any bill that can pass on their own 
would be better without her damaging input, even if she votes for it in the end. That's so in true. other words, 50-50 Senate and a 60-vote threshold for filibuster, the 50th vote matters, and that's Manchin. Yeah. Senate was the 49th. The 60th vote matters yeah. because that will pass it. But the 52nd and 51st vote don't mean a thing. That's what he's saying. He's right. Uh, yeah, I, that is an interesting observation and uh, something that Manchin should take note of. At, at, at that point, bipartisanship, whatever that – I mean, I guess he still takes that to mean at least one Republican voting for it or whatever. Yeah, but, I mean, so if you get a 54-vote – uh, you know, I. Yeah, that's bipartisanship. And I, I'm trying to remember this. The Senate votes no, but the House votes nay for reasons that I don't understand. I can and tell so, you, but then you'd have to kill yeah. yourself because it would be so boring. <laughs> a 17 part series by David Wall. Yeah. Why this happened? So, uh, what happens is that uh, if you get your 51st or 52nd vote. Um, and yeah. it means nothing. And you can say that it's bipartisan, but you lose. Right. Then what's the point? The most bipartisan votes they've had uh, in, in or, or that they're likely to have in most bipartisan impeachment ever. Like well, right. I mean, fine. Yeah. Those are bragging rights. That's not actually results. Yeah. That's one of the problems with it. I mean, so, yeah, the, without the filibuster, you're, I think, much more likely to have. Uh, bipartisanship in a 50-50 Senate than It'll with the filibuster. It'll mean something. Yeah, right. Uh, now uh, you have Collins, you know, do I put myself out there for something that I, I possibly actually personally believe in but won't succeed because we'll need to get to 60 and we'll only have 51 or 59 for that matter? Or do I, you know, and then I have to live with the uh, opprobrium of my conference or do I at least say, well, at least I've done something that I approved of, even if the rest of my conference didn't, and I, I was a maverick, and it passed with 51 or 52 votes. Or, uh, yeah, I, I, otherwise, uh, just all the things that they can, all the votes that they can cast in safety, in collaboration with their conference, knowing that they're not going to get to 60. Right, right. Yeah. Collins or whoever can vote for it and say, Either I wasn't way you the look at 50th it. vote. I wasn't even the 51st vote. I was the 49th. Cinema and Mansion were the 50th and 51st. Yeah. I don't know. It's true. They can hide behind that. But yeah, when uh, so long no, as. Who cares? Uh, who cares if it was 52? An overwhelming you know, bipartisan uh, vote. Murkowski and I voted for it, and who cares? You know, we yeah. it, it, it only needed 50. Yeah. So what's the problem, right? You can't blame it on right. us. So. I can blame uh, the Brian Boyle is commenting on this article from Politico. Hmm. Colin Schumer rift shocks Senate. Shocks the Senate the way Claude Rains was shocked in Casablanca. <laughs> I guess so. What was there a, a relationship? I don't know. I uh, never heard of it. You know why? Why is it shocking? You know uh, the fact uh, of the matter is no Chuck Schumer is saying out loud what's true, which is to say your vote doesn't matter unless you bring nine of your colleagues, and you can't. Yeah. Right. Nor well, Boiler tried, notes, probably. if anything, it helps Democrats by limiting the temptation to water down the plans for votes that they either don't need or won't get. Oh. OK, well, well, you know, if it helps you pass it, I'm all for watering it down <laughs> if it'll help you pass it. Yeah. If it's not going to help you pass it, then there's no point in doing that. So that's the background for a lot of the maneuvering that's going on here. And part of that maneuvering, I have to say, is the idea that uh, Republicans, in fact, uh, don't know how to govern. They merely know how to perform. How do we know that? Well, oh. for example, Roger Wicker. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right. Good. Roger Wicker is a senator. He offered an amendment sort of. to the bill, which I believe was accepted and which I'm guessing he voted for, to the uh, COVID relief bill hmm. that helped Did he the restaurant that? industry. Which, by the way, needed help because, you know, yes, he said uh, so. even if you we open full so. and uh, if you keep your mask and social distancing, you can't really fill up. And therefore, yes, uh, you know, it's uh, they need help. So he he proposed this amendment. It was accepted. And then, of course, what did he do? He voted against the bill. Yes. But despite voting against the bill, he's taking credit for helping to save the restaurant industry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Because, you know, you've heard of stolen valor. This is stolen empathy. True. Uh, it's been done before, but, yeah, this is just 
I don't know. This is this is a, a particularly egregious example. Did he even offer an amendment? I'll have to look at look he through it. He did um, offer an amendment. He says he did anyway in his tweet. I mean, he says so. I offered an amendment and uh, it was great. And because of that, uh, something, something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm going to look for the look for the record on it. And I'm, I'm not certain that that will necessarily reflect that it could have been uh, 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 included in an unblock amendment moved by someone else. So uh, it's possible. I did see that he was claiming uh, in reaction to charges of hypocrisy. Well, you know, I've been saying that the restaurants needed relief for a long time. And just because the bill contained one good provision doesn't mean I need to vote for it, uh, you know, when I oppose all the rest of it. But yeah, our own uh, uh, David Neer commenting on that yesterday saying, yeah, even that's garbage because Democrats passed a restaurant a relief bill in the last Congress in the House and sent it over to the Senate and the Senate would do nothing with it. And Roger Wicker was happy to sit on his hands and help Mitch McConnell defeat it then, even though he supported it then. So he's full of it either way. But again, you know, what this is an indication of is that the uh, that he sucks. Well, but, yes, but, but also but that, yes. that Republicans, including McConnell and including Wicker, realize this is popular and people like it. Yeah. And I better try to run out in front of the parade and pretend I was leading. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a it's a thing that senators and, and all elected officials do. But this one is particularly embarrassing because of how high profile Republican opposition to it was. And uh, yeah, I mean, even. Uh, Murkowski, Lisa Murkowski, who I, I think was the first one that we got wind of, generally speaking, who had supported or offered an amendment that had passed and been adopted into the bill, but then voted against the bill, wasn't first out of the gate claiming credit afterwards, even on her own thing. I guess she let a decent interval pass, I guess, unless we just didn't catch her. But Right. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's all of a piece, though, and just something to keep an eye on. Mm. Uh, you know, it isn't just noise to say, oh, this is popular. In fact, this is popular. It's a hard fact. And you'll find Republicans acting accordingly. Now, they may try to come up with clever ways to get around the fact that they voted against something that was really popular. But the yes. point is, it's really popular. Right. Oh, and of course, even if Wicker is right, then we're just in I voted for it before I voted against it territory, which, as we know, is a candidacy killer in the eyes of uh, black and white, hard nosed Republicans. Mm hmm. So. Switching topics here, just in, uh, the Pfizer BioNTech uh, coronavirus vaccine, the Pfizer, was okay. at least 97% effective in preventing symptomatic COVID-19 cases, 94% okay. effective against asymptomatic infection, oh. according to real-world data from Excellent. Israel. All and right. the analysis suggests the Pfizer vaccine the could world. significantly reduce asymptomatic transmission, a key driver of infections in addition to preventing yeah. severe illness and death. Shoo. And this gets back to uh, how you report this complex stuff. For example, Waleed uh, Jalad, who is a M MD, Master of Public Health, MPH, okay. at Pittsburgh, says, I'm oh. disappointed in Pfizer for making statements about the level of efficacy for asymptomatic infection. Oh. Buried in the release, vaccine effectiveness estimates may be affected by differences between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated people, in other words, different test-seeking behaviors. Oh, so oh, if you have lost. different groups who ask to be tested at different rates, oh. it doesn't help you really figure out what the asymptomatic infection rate okay, is. Okay, interesting. It's a certain rate right. among those tested, and among those tested may be different groups compared to people who don't believe in the vaccine, yeah. don't believe in the virus, and, and never get themselves problem. tested. That's a group we want to know an answer about. What, what's, what happens to people who refuse to get vaccines and refuse to get tested? We'll never know, but yeah, I want to know about how much disease are they carrying and passing around and yeah in other words how we well does it work with republicans that's what i want to know <laughs> yeah i guess that's not really just it. how well does it work with democrats i want to know how well does it work with republicans so those yes. are different groups and they have different behaviors in terms of the vaccine one group gets vaccinated gets tested wears masks and social mm. distances yes and so if those vaccine huh. people in fact uh, you know have one response to the vaccine is it the same as in the republicans who don't distance, who yeah. don't wear masks, who open up Texas, 
also are vaccinated, oh. but it's a different group of people and they have different behaviors. And is the vaccine effective equally in both? We don't know that. And, and that's kind of an important thing to know. And that gets back to the whole idea of how do you talk about vaccines? And we, we started doing this earlier in the week or last week. I don't even remember. Time is a circle, right? Yes. But uh, the, the thing is, if you give results like that, yeah. what do they actually mean? What are you testing? What are you looking uh, for? Is it a study that's designed to look at the asymptomatic infection rate or merely a secondary feature that yes. happens to be reported. Hmm. Oh. And if you're looking at a small group of people that's part of the study, can you use those good looking numbers to say with certainty that that's hmm. what's gonna happen in the real world? That's why it's so important that this was a real hmm. words world study. All that. the studies that show that they prevent death and prevent uh, ICU admission are great, hmm. but you have to be very careful when it says, look, it pre prevents it 100 percent. Well, 100 percent of the 100 people that we looked at, 100 percent of the 14,000 people that we looked at. But yeah. there's 33, 330 million people in this country. Yeah, Are you saying you're guaranteeing that nobody will ever die if they get this vaccine? You said 100 percent. No, oh, come I'm on. saying that. Yeah. Well, so, well then it's not 100 percent. Then you lied to us. I No. <sighs> It's like I'm talking about your five-year-old. You said I could yeah, have so candy. We're going to get into that because there's a really lovely discussion in 538 about exactly that. We'll oh. do that after the week. Okay. It also reminds me a lot of last week's discourse. About, I'm beginning to understand now, as you're saying, that there are certain groups that just won't do anything to protect themselves no matter what. I'm beginning to understand uh, the whole uh, Neanderthal Cro-Magnon thing and how it worked itself out thousands of years ago. Um, why one group just simply the disappeared. Homo sapiens. The Homo sapiens uh, did this and the Neanderthals didn't. Bye. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for Kigro in the Morning. I have good news to report. Many more listeners like you are making critical contributions that keep our show on the air. Makes good sense, of course, and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple. Now you can make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. Maybe you'd like to thank us for helping keep you sane during the Trump era. Maybe you're looking forward to in-depth explanations of what's going on in the Biden administration. Whatever it is that keeps you listening, we need your help to keep bringing it to you. And hey, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running with those options too. Thanks again, everyone, for all of your support. We literally could not do this without you. Welcome back now to the Gay Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Lots of, uh, lots of stories about credit seeking. Now, I'm thinking about that. Uh, uh, the, the wicker thing reminds me also, well, you know, we're probably going to get to it. Maybe I'll just wait and see. It's probably on your story list. But uh, uh, well, well, as it turns out, all the living former now. presidents except Donald Trump have banded right. together for a national ad campaign designed mm -hmm. to drive trust in COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, it might as well be a list of people who deserve state funerals. Yes, that's right. I saw you passed on to me our friend's tweet here. Uh, from earlier this morning, our grudging one, our good friend from Twitter, pointing out, uh, picking up on the theme, uh, really, minimum basic requirement for a state funeral as an ex-president would have been, uh, if you were alive and didn't participate in a public service announcement telling people to get vaccinated, yeah, uh, don't look for anybody working on your Mount Rushmore carving, don't look for anybody uh, working towards getting you set up in the capital rotunda to lie in state, you uh, more likely, uh, well, you're more deserving of an Osama bin Laden funeral than anything else. Right. You know, it's most interesting because of all the living former presidents, Trump was the only one who caught it, the only one who spread it, <laughs> and was the earliest one to get a vaccine. That's true, and has nothing to say about it, uh, either in the PSA or as people are talking about it now lately. Uh, I, I don't know. I thought it was more widely known at the time, but maybe I was just assuming but that he had secretly, secretly gotten himself vaccinated in January before he lost the power No, he didn't tell Japan. anybody. He, it was a wasted opportunity because he could yeah. have done an Elvis and done it on TV sure. and got his group to do it. Even and you know, he decided it. not to, because uh, probably because they didn't pay him. 
maybe that, that could be the bottom line of you it. Know, you could, I don't you know could what have else the explanation was. That, uh, you know, you could have uh, $10, a free hamburger and a Coke and uh, a Diet Coke, whatever it is you drink, and, <laughs> and, uh, and we'll do it on TV. Yeah, that might have worked. It might, you don't know what his price was. Uh, but yeah, he, he, it's interesting that he even got it at all, given that, of course, he was holding massive rallies right in the middle of the pandemic and telling everybody it's oh, well, and this I don't understand why his supporters like this either. I am immune, he told people. I mean, you're not you out there. You're not. And I'm. Oh, it's part of the eugenics put, thing. I have great genes. Yeah, white genes. And uh, so I'm, I'm a disease proof and you can be too. Just vote for me. Yeah. But that does lead to some questions. I mean, obviously, it, it doesn't question. surprise me that he doesn't uh, believe himself when he says I'm immune. But what a situation. The guy might possibly believe he's immune because he caught it. Uh, of course, he believes he defeated the disease, not only because of his great genes, but because he got the miracle awesome cure, which he then told he was going to give everybody for free. And he didn't. And 325,000 more people are dead since he said he was going to do that, by the way. And uh, well, but then know, he secretly got vaccinated on top. He said 10, 15 people <laughs> most. Right. Know. So several hundred thousand uh, would be on his conscience if there were such a thing. So I don't know. Uh, yeah, he's incredible. And, and every day uh, does more to convince people how much less he did than was necessary. But it's a real pleasure not having him on, on Twitter. Not that I, I'm I not certain that. he's not. I love not seeing him every morning. It's fantastic. In fact, there's a whole story about how he's trying to yeah. do with press releases what he did on Twitter, and it's just totally falling flat. And nobody really cares. Life imitating art, too. There, I remember you know, when he would tweet, people thought it was a funny parody, and it was, to turn it into you know the format of a real press release and make right. it look like a real press and release. And now, now what happens is the press release that. winds up in your junk file. <laughs> right. And, it's uh, in the spam folder. Oh, well, that's because it's Trump. And it's a lot easier to to resist the temptation to retweet it when you know that he's desperately, you know, hoping that people will do that. I mean, he always was, but it was so easy to just retweet his tweets and comment on it. And people said, well, you take a screenshot, whatever. But now that's how it has to get on Twitter in the first place is a a uh, a journalist has to say, I'm going to this is so dumb. I have to take a picture of it and tweet it around. And he tweeted yesterday. That is to say, he released a press release designed to look like a tweet, which was the opposite of what we used to do and parody of what he did. Uh, he used to tweet and people would turn it into a press release. Now he releases press releases that are designed to look and sound like tweets, complete with sticking to the character limit. Yesterday, he was tweeting out his uh, desperate bid for credit for the vaccine. And, you know, most people viewed it as fairly pathetic and, and it really was. But yeah, out there saying, I hope everybody remembers that these beautiful shots wouldn't have happened if it weren't for me, the guy who only got one in secret because of how much and wouldn't I approve of uh, state money to get it to mm. you. Yeah, you know, right. let's not forget that. So if you if you want uh, one, all of this the elected is happening. president. And meanwhile, places like Texas are opening up the vaccine for 50 plus in a couple of weeks. Uh, At least by that's March 15th, open by the Ides, that'll happen. Uh, Connecticut's already 55. New Hampshire's going to be 50 plus. So more and more people are becoming mm, eligible uh, as more and more vaccine gets on the market, including the 100 million doses older. that Biden announced yesterday are coming from Johnson and Johnson. Yeah. And this is a piece uh, from uh, 538 oh, right. that Maggie Quirth put together, which was a 538 chat. Really interesting. How to convince people the Johnson and Johnson vaccine is as good as the others. And we talked about uh, just the say. fact that from a public health messaging, you can't say all the vaccines are the same because they're not. And at the same time, uh, you can't say they're 100 percent this or that because they're not, but they're great. And so how do you balance all that stuff? They were very popular. So they're talking here. with. Yeah, they are. So they're talking with a couple of people. Uh, and this is a, a, a talk uh, amongst some uh, experts, people named including uh, Anna Rothschild. Maggie uh, Korth, who's the senior science writer at 538, Neil Lewis, who's a professor of communication and social behavior at Cornell. And uh, they say, so uh, we had an interesting pre-conversation to this, and I think it encapsulates some of the trouble with how to talk about this stuff. We're debating whether or not there should be a graphic showing the efficacies of the different vaccines uh, in reference to the Ashish Jha uh, table that he put around which showed that it's 100% effective against uh, severe infection uh, yeah, and death, right, right. which is true in the small numbers, but not a guarantee. 
And uh, Anna Rothschild said, yeah. And then we realized that might be a fool's errand. There's basically no way to do it without misleading people. And that's complicated by the fact that different people care about different things. So if you're looking at it in terms of whether it prevents illness and you're looking at it in terms of whether it prevents spread yeah. and you're looking at it, whether uh, or not basically can I get this and go hug my grandkids? Those are three completely separate things. So not everybody looks at the same thing. And citing one thing doesn't necessarily prove anything about something else. And also, yeah. different clinical trials cared about different things and not necessarily what people cared about. And the trials happened at different times in different places with different variants. So it's really hard to compare them. Yes. So the headlines have been about the overall that efficacy rate. But the numbers might not mean what you think they mean. Okay. Uh, right? I'm sure J&J that's looks worse than the other two. But J&J &J was tested during a very different time period, so it's not fair to compare them head to head. And Johnson & Johnson looked at preventing moderate to severe disease. Moderna and Pfizer looked at preventing symptomatic disease. Those are not the same things, and they looked at different things. We, we went into this in some detail the mm -hmm. other day, but it's complicated. And so you have to talk about nuance, and if you're going to talk about nuance, you're already losing. Okay. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I, I'm adding that. They didn't say okay. that, but I'm saying. I mean, I know no, it's, it's true. Because what a somebody's going to say, okay, but, here. you know, you got this wrong or, you know, you misled us about that. And so, you know, that's what happens when you wind up dealing with vaccine uh, hesitancy and people arguing about whether that's the correct term. Mm. I mean, if you have a group of people, for example, mm. that uh, are looking, one. let's say you have a population of black Americans. We do. And you realize that the pandemic started to take off just about the same time that the Black Lives Matter stuff was was uh, a major issue. Mm -hmm. And you see the United States government ignore you and what it means to you on Black Lives Matter. Why should you trust everything the federal government is doing when it comes to the pandemic? OK. I mean, if there's institutional distrust that's probably a more fair and more truthful way of looking at how you approach the vaccine than why won't you be convinced that you should get it? Hmm. You know, it's not on you. You should be asking why the institution's untrustworthy. Yes. Sure, I guess so. And the fact that the, the institution has changed uh, leadership doesn't why don't necessarily you trust the pharmacy say much companies? either because bad history. Yeah. Why don't you trust your insurance hmm. company to give you the best possible advice about whether or not to get a vaccine? I don't know. I how, how, could there be, how could there be mistrust or distrust of uh, pharmaceutical companies and insurance? How, how can that be Impossible. in this country? I don't know. All right. Oh, okay. so, uh, you know, so if you want to present numbers, you've got to be very careful about it. And, uh, you know, it just occurs to me as part of this discussion, and, and you had brought it up earlier, what if... You know, this is a imagined scenario. What if this were the first year that influenza hit this country? And how would we react to that? Hmm. Like, it's hard to stop. It's ubiquitous. It's a respiratory virus. There's a vaccine for it that not everybody likes yeah. and accepts. And uh, a lot of people die from it, but we're not exactly totally sure about the numbers. Yeah, what would we say? Well, are you though? lying about influenza? You're not giving us the full picture. Well, because it's complicated. We've been studying it for 100 years, and we're still not sure exactly yeah. how many people die. What would people say uh, in denying it? It's just what? It's not just the flu. It's, it's new. Just, it's, it's just, just coronavirus. Cholera. I don't know what's called. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, the common cold coronavirus. It's just worse, a little bit worse than the, the common cold. And I guess that wouldn't be a, an awful encapsulation of of it but uh yeah well so Anna, Anna hmm. Rothschild gives an example all right take the flu vaccine i think when people get the Please flu shot and it. then get the flu they lose trust in the vaccine but what if they heard that the flu vaccine was about uh, 40 to 60 percent effective from year to year well then they might not even get it in the first place and yeah that's not what you, want. Of people you want them to get it that. but you also want them to know that it doesn't make you flu proof right and so if you're the uh, uh person who's in charge of messaging hmm. that's a tough sell it is. Um, I wonder if that'll change now that they can say, well, yeah, it's remember, it is only 40 to 60 percent. Remember effective, flu? But... There was no flu season this year. Right. There isn't any flu. You're lying. It's all made up. <laughs> there never was any flu. Or, or, wow, now your flu vaccine is 100 percent effective or nearly. Uh, but I mean, you could say, remember, this thing is only 40 to 60 percent effective. It's a good idea to get it. But also wash your hands and wear a mask. 
because that right. worked pretty now, good last year. Vaccine time. does minimize illness. It may prevent the worst side effects. It may prevent hospitalization. Like That's why you should get it. You don't have to get it. Then again, you don't have to get flu. And you can yeah. get flu every year. And there's a different vaccine every year. Yes. And it's complicated. So when the mayor of Detroit says you don't want the 6,200 JAJ doses because Detroit residents deserve the best vaccine, you have an issue here. And part of the paradox is that Johnson & Johnson has great advantages. Okay? It's one and done. Yes. It doesn't have to be refrigerated. Right. It's easier to get to remote areas. Mm -hmm. And so does that make it an inferior vaccine because now the poor have access to it? And I only want yeah, Cadillac I vaccines. See, you know, right? I, it, as you're saying it, it's like, well, oh, it's so perfect with it being one dose and not requiring that kind of crazy refrigeration. It's perfect for like roaming the streets, giving the vaccine to people who are otherwise either too difficult to locate in the first place, or even if you do, uh, perhaps you might say they're a little less reliable at coming back for their second shot, either because they're homeless or. Uh, you are not sure when you're going to get that second dose, any number of reasons. And then, it, but then it becomes known as, yeah, this is the, this is oh, the you, one you want the, the homeless back. Right. No, no, it's, it's, well, a, I have a home. I don't need that. I can get the, the good one. Right. And then of course, if you convince everybody that it's actually the, uh, a very good option or even the better option, and then, then you'll have Republicans saying, look, why are they wasting it on prisoners and the homeless? <sighs> yeah. Someone will get you coming or going. Why are they sending it overseas? Right. Where, you know, you know so uh, oh. they, they take this on. Uh, Maggie, oh. course, says, look, this is a paradox. These specific vaccines for the specific disease exist on top of America's already grossly inequitable healthcare system and on yes. top of years of all different kinds of social inequity. So in J&J, &J, you have a vaccine that works well, has some benefits. It doesn't require crazy elaborate refrigeration system with smoke coming out of it. Right. People only need one dose. It's less prone to causing allergic reactions. All good things. But because our society has a wildly inequitable infrastructure, those things make it seem like a really good choice for people who don't have as much access to health care with crazy deep freezers or people who can't take off work. Yeah. And which means you quickly get to a vaccine for the poor. And, of course, poor people yeah. have a lot of feelings about that. Right. And, and but plenty of people have feelings about that. Rich people have feelings about that. Thank God I don't have to take the vaccine for the poor, even though it's the better one. Or, OK, yeah. <sighs> Wow. Yeah, there's a lot wrapped right? up so in that one. If there's an equitable distribution plan, uh, Neil says, for instance, if every place got relatively similar proportions of all the vaccines, and we talked about the fact that when you sign up mm. on the uh, vaccine administration module uh, and you get to your clinic, you don't know which vaccine you're going to get. It may say, uh, and it may or may not be that when you get there. So if every place got relatively similar proportions of the vaccines and then you could choose like a menu, I'll have the number two. <laughs> Uh, I guess. fries with that, the big fries though. Right. Then that Always. might alleviate some of those concerns, but then that could create logistical issues. And we've already seen inequitable distribution across the country. Just yeah. look at Florida. Right. Right. If you give a lot of money to the governor, you can get it. Otherwise you can't. Right. When I was tweeting about this the other day, Maggie said several black people replied, but I'll believe J and J isn't just the scam that's getting dumped on us. When I start seeing white celebrities and politicians choosing it over Pfizer or Moderna, mm. which is not an unreasonable position to take. It's and not. that's why it would have been very helpful to uh, perhaps have the president tell us which vaccine they were getting, which uh, they didn't. Oh yeah, possibly. I'm getting J and J. It's not just for the poor. That or might Obama nice. got J&J, &J, but the other ones got Pfizer, you know. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, uh, it certainly might have worked out that way. I mean, I, all I can tell you is uh, I, I wish. I'm just saying it's complicated. It's yeah. complicated to do. And what you think you're doing, you may not actually do. The message you think you're sending may not be the message that's being received. Right, right. Uh, and uh, it certainly, I don't think anybody would have given a crap one way or the other, but I could at least say, you know, okay, you'll uh, come to my uh, very upper middle class uh, fast growing wealthy exurb here and the j and j vaccine went like crazy the minute it hit the market it was gone and we're sitting on piles of the other vaccines and getting a i mean it's great that getting an appointment for it is is now relatively easy but you know does does any portion of America, much less uh, black America, care what happened? And oh, really, a bunch of people who aren't famous at all and are in a generic white suburb somewhere snapped up. The, well, OK, maybe that's interesting. Or maybe they'll think, what a bunch of idiots. They took, I don't know. Right. 
Oh. Now, in a related uh, question, and I'm sure Maggie says, everywhere. And, and, and the whole discussion is just really good and very nuanced. Maggie says, I want to ask you guys something, because a lot here reminds me of the early discourse around masks when public health officials were yes. saying to people, masks won't help. And what they meant was, we don't have right. proof they do, because it hasn't been studied. Right. And also, we're worried about people hoarding N95 and hospitals not having any. Yeah, yeah. I remember. So it seems to me like there's been a little of an end justifies the means simplification in public health. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. And Anna Rushall says, I don't think public health ever wins by hiding complexity from people, especially when it comes to vaccines. People are already primed to see conspiracy theories about medical interventions we give to healthy people. Yeah. And it's not a modern thing. People have had anti-vax sentiment for over 200 years, uh, you know, back to the smallpox vaccine. Yeah. And earlier, okay. Anna made a point about talking about our goals, and I think it's important to clarify. The mass debacle was about officials trying to prevent the hoarding of N95s when hospitals needed them. Yes. They should have just said that. Yeah, uh, I think she's right there. It's not always that the complexity will make it into everybody's head, but at least uh, when they discover later on, oh, there was this complexity, and it was never hidden. I just didn't happen across it or look for it. And then it's on me. At least some portion of the people will think that. That's better so than Maggie that. says in both cases, in the vaccine and in the mask issue, we're seeing an oversimplification of what's going on because the details and nuance feel too messy to somebody. Mm. Experts are afraid. This is where they get paternalistic, which is what Ashish Jha, the, the uh, uh, dean of the Brown School of Public Health, said the other day. Mm. Don't be paternalistic. The experts are afraid it might be misunderstood as we don't know what we're doing. Don't trust us. Yeah, Okay. So, so they don't say, we don't know this. Uh, again, this is a Fauci thing. We don't know this, but here's what we do know is how you're supposed to approach this. But if you do that and people figure out there's nuance anyway, it looks like maybe you don't know what you're doing and that they shouldn't trust you. And the thesis here is science is hard and communicating it is twice as hard. Yeah. Which okay. is true. It's really hard to do this properly. Just take the, ex you know, you know, you, you look at the four presidents or three presidents or, you know, well, it was uh, George W. Bush leading off. The ad that they did had the Republican leading off and then it was Clinton and then it was Obama and Carter. Mm -hmm. OK, and they all got vaccinated and they all had pictures of them getting vaccinated. And, uh, you know, I, I saw it. My first thought was, OK, which one got which? Yeah. Uh, and I, it might. Yeah, is it better not to tell? Or? That wasn't part of the ad, but that's the first yeah. thing that occurred to me. Okay. Well, yeah, it's a good anyway, question. Now I want to know what the Trump Don't oversimplify. Is. Tell the truth. Be as honest as you can. And uh, that's the deal. Yeah. Okay. What did Trump get? Do we know? Bob's discount uh, furniture version? Or? Trump got fired. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> hey, the up and up store brand version of it. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, okay. Well, I, I don't think, maybe it wouldn't be, you maybe you don't want to tell which one he got. I don't know. People would avoid okay. that one. All right. Uh, well, anyway, this, uh, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know if that question will ever be answered, and, and but that does go to the point of, isn't it better to just put that out there? Eh, yes, it's always it better to put that out there. Here's what we know. Here's what we don't know. Yeah. And if As we get more information, we will change our guidance. Ah, uh, yes. Subject to change. Why not say that? People are used to that as a disclaimer by now, generally yeah, speaking. Yeah, this is new. Oh, you don't know anything. No, actually, we know a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so I can give you an idea of what's going on here as an expert without telling you I know everything. Right? And meanwhile... Yeah. Uh, since, uh, you know, Biden has been president, uh, an interesting thing has happened. Uh, hospitalization rates are plummeting for seniors since early January. Age 65 plus is down 82%. Why. Age 75 to 84 is down 83%. Age 85 plus is down 85%. That is to say, you're getting the nursing homes vaccinated, and it turns out it's working. Mm. Yeah. That's that's right? the explanation. That's, that's all a good thing. At a current rate, all groups will fall to a post-March 2020 low within the next two weeks. Okay. Rates are way down for all age groups. Okay, and that and with the supply on its way, you just mentioned J and J in your area. If we solve the demand side, that is various and very different pockets of vaccine hesitancy and distrust around the country, we could be teed up for a big summer. That means an economic boom, and that's why Republicans are so nervous about all of this. Yeah. And that's why it's so weird that they don't want to take. Uh, credit for it, uh, they're trying to by pretending they didn't do what they did and did what they didn't do, but uh, they didn't sign on for it. They could have said, I voted for this boom, 
and they can't now, and their opponents will remind them. Hmm. You know, okay. it's not. This is not in a vacuum. Well, they'll get away with it because they'll just say, "Yeah," but their opponents are going to say something else, and then they have the receipts. Yes, true. Right, <sighs> and so you have a lot of nervous Republicans. They're nervous about this backfiring possibility of the voter suppression stuff that they're doing. They may wind up cutting off senior votes, which are their votes. They're nervous about whether or not there's an economic boom and Democrats get credit for it. That's been something that they've been worrying about since the original Medicare in the 60s. They hate the idea that these great programs get associated with Democrats. That goes back to the New Deal. It goes back to before the 60s. The reason they were so hesitant in the 60s is they didn't want a New Deal situation where Democrats get credit for saving the country. They hate that. They're Republicans. Mm -hmm. It doesn't help them get elected. And that's their job. Get elected. You know, the right. policy stuff is just a vehicle to get there. If they could get elected without doing policy at all, well, the Republicans, look at what's going on now. They never pass anything. Right. True. You know, Easy it's again. performative. Everything they do is performative. So yeah. that's yeah. my uh, rant for today. OK, I think it's a good one. And Here's an interesting uh, one. Michael Knigge, who's a uh, German reporter living in the United States covering politics. 63% of lower income Republicans support President Biden's coronavirus relief bill. Only 25% of upper income Republicans. Mm. This comes from Pew Data. And so uh, when you talk it? about the Republicans trying to be the party of the working class. Uh, uh, yeah. -uh. Right. Well, yeah, that, that would have gone down the tubes on the uh, minimum wage bill as well, or the, the votes on it. Uh, but well, here's yet another proof. minimum wage bill. This, I mean, it's just it's not happening. Uh, you yeah, know, it's, well, it's white resentment. Size, and in so. fact, uh, there's uh, uh, an interesting tweet about that. Uh, I think it was it Dave Weigel. Uh, see if I can I can track that one down. I had it uh, tucked away somewhere that uh, uh, here it is. Uh, this is from Jeff Jarvis. Quoting David Drucker, okay. who was on uh, Morning Joe this morning for Republicans today. All politics is cultural. Yes. It's got nothing to do whatsoever with economics or governance or anything else that the government does that might help you. It's all cultural. Yeah. And that's why all they talk about is Dr. Seuss. Yeah. Uh, which is another issue. Like, OK, let's suppose we uh, agree with them at first and say, all right, let's talk about culture. OK, well, fine. Good. Ready? American culture. Mr. Potato Head and Dr. Seuss. Wow. I had hoped we had. More to our credit than those two things, but I guess that's what you want to talk about. That's that that's what passes for American culture among Republican thinkers. You know. Right. I, anyway, that's it for stuff. me. I'll be back on Monday. Okay. We'll do it again. Very good. Maybe. You know, not so much chaos though. Uh, today, uh, Biden addresses the nation at some point, and uh, oh, you know, it's good to have his bill. He'll sign it if he has. He's going to sign it Friday. He's going to talk today, yes, and he's, he's announced he's going to sign it Friday. And then the checks go out next week. Yeah. If you're out. I'm already seeing people say, well, wh why don't you sign it sign it today, and then the checks will go out also next week. But but something, something. Well, all right. I guess they got a stage of production about it, too. I I, I don't know whether uh, it's interesting. Does, does any uh, behind-the-scenes work on facilitating getting those checks rolling start? Now, knowing that the signature is coming tomorrow, or do they have to wait for the signature? I've never really been clear on that. That's an interesting question. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know why they wait. I guess this might just really be we want it to be on, on a Friday and to be the last thing that we do this week. I don't know if it makes right. any appreciable difference in when the checks roll, but there's certainly that anyway, question looming. Yep, th hey, that's Abby. it. And, okay. Uh, I'll talk to you Monday. Very good. Okay. We'll see you then. Bye, Abby. Uh, thanks for stopping by. And uh, all right, yeah, just a few minutes here before we exit for the uh, top of the hour break. Uh, apologies uh, all around to uh, our, well, one of many actual Karens who listen to the program each day and has been complaining for months, quite justifiably so, that uh, we perpetuate, uh, if it's not really a stereotype necessarily about people named Karen. I don't think anybody really takes it seriously. Uh, but who knows? I mean, there could be generations that get raised uh, no, thinking that the actual, the, the actual name has something to do with it. Or there are many ways to depopularize a name. No one names their kids Adolf anymore, right? And we don't want that to be the case for Karens. Poor Karen. 
in all of this. I don't know why they settled on it. Uh, it is a stereotype in itself, of course, because, uh, you know, they, they could have chosen any number of names and they settled very consciously on one that would be resonant. And so it's unfair that way. But OK, anyway, uh, more apologies to Karen, uh, I think, for that. Uh, after all, we've been grousing about the messaging and whether we call something a stimulus bill or a covid relief bill. We ought to be say, paying the same attention to the people who, through no fault of their own, are stuck with the name Karen, which is a fine name, and it's nothing to be worried about being stuck with. It's just the rest of us uh, making a mess of it. So apologies again. I think that's it. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah, here's a good explanation for why wait until Friday for the, the signing ceremony, the mighty OCD, uh, suggesting that they all want to, well, get uh, get drunk after the signing. It's, uh, you know, the... One of the vulgar terms for going out there and getting drunk, and we don't do that here. Although we absolutely could. We just resist it on principle, but I'm not certain what the principle is. That could be it. I don't really know. Uh, like Friday is a time when I, I always thought that the old Friday news dump was when things disappeared. But I think it's supposed to be a uh, a closing note. And if you're not announcing something from the White House, there's some chance that it disappears in a Friday news cycle. But I suppose if it's the White House saying, yes, coronavirus relief is here at last and the money will begin to flow, that's something that everybody has time for on a Friday in the news organization, so it won't be buried. So, okay, we wait for that. Uh, let's see. Oh, um, appreciative of the tweet from Congressman Bill Pascrell of New Jersey uh, tweeting around, don't ever forget that every single Republican in Congress voted to tell you to go to hell with a picture of uh, his proposed version of those uh, support checks saying that it's courtesy of President Biden. Biden and congressional Democrats and every Republican voted against it. All right, welcome back now to the K Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, let's see. Oh, I just was thinking about something on the way out from the break, and I said, "Oh, don't forget to." And one minute has passed, and I've now forgotten what it was I wasn't supposed to forget to tell you. But ah, yes, right. Bill Pascrell's tweet about. Uh, what he proposes be on the memo line of the checks, reminding everybody that all the Republicans had voted against it. It reminded me that this morning, uh, some of the other polling, some of the polling we discussed with Greg and the other polling that I have seen elsewhere, or maybe it was even the same polling now that I think about it. Uh, but um, some uh, interesting, pers I don't know, interesting perspective, I thought, on the uh, notion that every Republican had voted against passing this bill. Uh, polling that I had seen both yesterday, I saw Adam Bonin circulating a, uh, a tweet yesterday commenting on the popularity as measured in the poll. What was this one? Let me find his tweet here. Uh, he was noting on top of the screen grab that he had and in response to a tweet about the new Politico slash What's MC, Paul? I don't remember. Anyway, uh, I, got, I could look it up, but I forget. All the polling people know offhand. But anyway, uh, is it Monmouth College? Maybe? I don't know. Anyway, uh, even the people who hate Joe Biden, Adam says, like the American Rescue Plan. And there's a chart here that I think is taken from the poll, but uh, it's also in response to Jesse Ferguson laying out the results here. And done this way, support for the American Rescue Plan, generally speaking, among all the populations surveyed, 75 percent support, 18 percent opposition. They asked uh, or they have cross tabs for baby boomers, evangelicals, Trump 2020 voters, uh, Republicans, etc. So even among Trump 2020 voters, 55 percent support for the American Rescue Plan. That's the worst number out there. Uh, among Republicans in general, 59% support for the American Rescue Plan, according to this poll. Uh, and of course, uh, it, well, yeah, really, everybody. Uh, the, uh, the groups selected for Jesse's tweet, I think, are ones that they probably were surprised by the results of. Baby boomers, who we've heard too much to our 
chagrin were voting for Trump in great numbers, 74% support. Evangelicals, same sort of, you know, sob story about their voting for Trump, 74% support. Uh, and lower opposition, by the way, 20% versus 24% among the baby boomers. Trump voters, 55-38, and Republicans, 59-35. So a pretty good showing, right? Uh, then, of course, the other uh, piece of it here, the CBS YouGov poll asking the question about approval of Congress passing the COVID relief package, 75% support overall, 94% support among Democrats, 77% support among independents, 46% support among Republicans. This particular poll showing less than a majority in favor, but it's still a very strong showing, 46% support among Republicans, where you would think the numbers would be you know, 20 percent or or in thereabouts or, or lower under other you know ordinary circumstances and maybe for an ordinary bill. What struck me about that one, though, of course, was uh, I was thinking of the old Hastert rule, which I guess they're just embarrassed about having have ever been a rule, given what happened and what we found out about Hastert. But anyway, the old rule uh, for members of Congress, Republican members of Congress was uh, under the Hastert rule, we won't even bring a bill to the floor unless it's got 60 percent support among Republicans, by which they meant themselves as Republicans. That is um, the um, uh, the 60 percent support among the Republican conference. I don't think they really meant I mean, maybe they did and maybe it was translatable. We won't bring a bill to the floor unless it polls 60 percent support among rank and file Republican voters out there. Uh, but here, a situation where they wouldn't be able to get to 60% support among rank and file Republicans for the position that they ought to oppose passage of the American Rescue Plan. Only 46% of Republicans supported uh, the plan in this CBS poll. But that would, of course, mean you can't get to 60% opposition which would mean that if you were testing the position for under the Hastert rule, should Republicans in Congress be voting no then based on 60% opposition? The answer would be no, because we don't got 60% opposition. However, opposition ended up being the unanimous position of all Republicans in Congress. Nearly 50% of rank and file Republican voters were willing to tell CBS News when asked that they supported the passage. But did you see nearly 50% of Republicans voting in favor of it? No, not even 25%, not even 10%, not even 1%, because all of them opposed it. I think that the party in Congress is a little out of touch, maybe, with where their actual voters are, but. You only get the yes or no position, and uh, they feel like that the, the no is the more profitable. And they maybe maybe they even point to this and say, "Well, fifty-four percent—that's still a majority." Say no, but it's one of the problems with our winner-take-all system; it never explains anything. So, okay, I just thought that was kind of interesting and worth recapping. But uh, you know, your mileage may vary. By the way, I'm going to have to now I feel like I'm going to have to go and dig up a document that will explain the differences between voting uh, I or no or yay or no or yay and nay, as they sometimes term it. Um, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. But, yeah, my recollection off the top of my head was that it came from uh, what kind of vote was being asked for, at least in the House and. Uh, what, under what circumstances were you asking for the vote? I, my recollection was that they might have voted with a different set of questions, that is, the options being yay or nay or aye and no, depending on whether the House was voting in the committee of the whole House, or, which is where they do the bulk of their work on amendments or whether it was a final passage vote, which is taken in the House 
itself, the house sitting as the house. The, the house, the committee of the whole, I think I once explained, was a, is a parliamentary fiction that uh, they use to facilitate faster and more efficient work on bills when they're in the amending stage. Uh, that is, it's they just make up a committee called the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union is the name of the full thing. And uh, they consider themselves to be operating as a committee in, in which everyone is a member. Now, here's a question. Is Marjorie Taylor Greene a member of the Committee of the Whole House on the State of the Union or not? You don't have to be assigned to it. And so therefore, I guess you don't get to be stripped of your membership of it unless you're stripped of your membership in the House, in which case you have to be expelled. But that would be interesting. Oh, that's something to think about. I don't know when or at what point Marjorie Taylor Greene is offering her annoying adjournment uh, motions. Probably... I mean, maybe she's not following rules at all, and, and, and it might be that it's in order to offer it when the House is sitting as the committee of the whole, rather than waiting for the House to be in doing business as the, the House before resolving themselves into the committee of the whole. This is a very annoying discussion already. But if it was possible to strip her membership in the committee of the whole House and the State of the Union, it might restrict her ability to offer amendment motions to those periods in which the House is operating as the House before they take up consideration of bills. Interesting. Uh, it's a question about uh, five people in the world are interested in the answer to, and probably only four of the five can answer correctly, and I might be the, the fifth one there. Anyway, uh, if you were wondering whether there's really any uh, meaning to the the, the different the difference is when they ask for the eyes and nays versus when they ask for the yeas and nays or the yes and no votes. Um, very small difference, but it also indicates what sorts of votes. And and sometimes you'll hear it. You'll hear I used in the House when they're taking voice votes on things, uh, you know, and they say all those in favor say I, uh, all those opposed no. And uh, and then they'll announce the eyes have it and then they'll ask for a recorded vote usually on those things anyway and when they get those recorded votes taken those are taken as yay and yay and no or yay and nay i can't remember let's I'll take a look at uh the way the roll calls are recorded let's see here's an amendment vote was the last recorded vote taken in the house is yay and nay okay so interesting. And I think, though, the voting machines might just have yes, no on them rather than yay, nay, or maybe just y, n even. I don't know. All right. One day we'll spend some time looking up the history of that and why it works that way. Sounds like a Friday thing to do, though. And today is Thursday. So therefore, it can't happen. What can happen? Let's see. Let's look around what's in pocket here for us. Note quickly from Talking Points Memo. Uh uh, let's see, Representative Jamila Jayapal on Wednesday, just thought I'd update you on this one, requested that the House Committee on Ethics, you know those people, uh, encourage, or rather, uh, I'll skip down here, uh, the House Committee on Ethics and the Office of Congressional Ethics both investigate three House Republicans for instigating and aiding the deadly Capitol insurrection earlier this year. So looking for an investigation here in letters sent to the two groups, and they are different, the House Committee on Ethics and the Office of Congressional Ethics, two separate entities, Jayapal demands that it thoroughly investigate, I guess both of groups, uh, thoroughly investigate actions of, can you guess, Lauren Boebert, yes, Mo Brooks, sure, and Paul Gosar in the weeks and days leading up to the Capitol attacks and refer any appropriate findings to the Justice Department, which will be interesting. I don't know if the Ethics Committee will want to take up something that they end up referring to the Justice Department, but the uh, Office of Congressional Ethics sounds like the place that might be more interested in doing things that way. But the Ethics Committee might want to take it up as an internal matter as well. Um, let's see. You know, There's a whole explanation for uh, what the grounds of her uh, request really are. Uh, 
and uh, it's all very interesting. But I think that you know, what we need for our purposes is just the headline and the fact that the story exists. And if you want to dive into it, or if there are further developments, we will dive into it in the near future. Let's see. Other items of interest today, a New York Times editorial. And it's always of interest when they finally editorialize on things like this as an editorial board. For democracy to stay, the filibuster must go. And uh, yeah, we'll have to get back on that topic in the coming weeks just to prep you for uh, whatever action might ensue. And uh, part of that will be perusing editorials like this one. They ask in their subheader, what happens when the biggest election reform bill in half a century runs into one of the most formidable barriers to American governance? Full editorial board behind this one. It's hard to imagine a more fitting job for Congress than for members to join together to pass a broadly popular law that makes democracy safer, stronger, and more accessible to all Americans. Last week, the House of Representatives passed H.R. 1. The bill, a similar version of which the House passed in 2019, is a comprehensive and desperately needed set of reforms that would strengthen voting rights and election security, ban partisan gerrymandering, reduce big money in politics, and establish ethics codes for Supreme Court justices. The president, that's important, and other executive branch officials. The legislation has the support of at least 50 senators, plus the tie-breaking vote of Vice President Kamala Harris. President Biden is on board and ready to sign it. So what's the problem? You know, obviously. Majority support in the Senate isn't enough. In the upper chamber, a supermajority of 60 votes is required to pass even the most middling piece of legislation. We know that that's not exactly uh, how the rules actually state it, but we know that that's a practical reality. That requirement is not found in the Constitution or in the rules of the House for that, or Senate for that matter, but it's because of the filibuster, a centuries-old parliamentary tool that has been transformed into a weapon for strangling functional government. This is a singular moment for American democracy if Democrats are willing to seize it. Whatever grand principles have been used to sustain the filibuster over the years, it is clear as a matter of history, theory, and practice that it vindicates None of them. If America is to be governed competently and fairly, if it is to be governed at all, the filibuster must go. The most compelling reason to keep the filibuster is its proponent's argument that the rule prevents a tyranny of the majority in the Senate. That's the rationale of the two Democrats currently standing in the way of ending it. Senators Joe Manchin of West Virginia and Kirsten Sinema of Arizona. They have been steadfast in defending the modern filibuster, as part of what they assert is a long-standing Senate custom. It means to protect what the Senate was designed to be, Senator Sinema said. Debate on bills should be a bipartisan process, which it is, with or without the filibuster. That takes into account the views of all Americans, not just those of one political party. And they add here, parenthetically, for some reason, it's unlikely that any Republican senator will support getting rid of the filibuster today, even knowing that it would make legislating easier for them in the future. But because the filibuster is a Senate-created rule, that can be accomplished by a simple majority vote. Now, let me just stop and point out how remarkable it is for them to say so, and uh, because for years they said the opposite. And they said, everybody knows that not only does it take 60 votes to get anything done in the Senate, but it takes 67 votes to change the rules in the Senate. And that's why it can't happen. And the reason that the New York Times is able to say with certainty, even if they do it parenthetically, that uh, no, because the filibuster is a Senate created rule that can be accomplished by a single majority vote. A simple majority vote is, uh, well, to put it uh, bluntly, uh, me, I did that. Uh, But of course, lots of people helped me do that. Some of them directly, and I knew about it when we were working together, and others who had nothing to do with me but were saying the same thing simply because they also had found out that this was true. But uh, I'll say this. I think a large portion of the general public and uh, journalists uh, journalists realization that this is the case well it comes of course they, they would never 
point to my advocacy of it for a number of reasons and say that that's the reason. They would point to history. I saw it done in 2013 and again in 2017 when the Democratic and then Republican controlled Senates voted by majority vote to change the rules with respect to the filibuster and cloture on uh, nominations. First, all executive branch nominations and all court nominations save the Supreme Court and then bringing the Supreme Court nominations into that fold. So they would say, well, of course, it can be done by simple majority vote. We saw it happen that way. Why did it happen that way? It happened that way because the Senate finally convinced itself that it was allowed to do that. And that was the work that I participated in, even though the Senate was always allowed to do it. I didn't create the rule and I didn't even, uh, you know, stitch it together myself absent prior historical evidence. There was prior historical evidence. Was it the case that it had been forgotten along the way? Maybe. I don't know. There were definitely members of the Senate who did it the last time, but they wanted to forget. I don't know what the reason is for that. But um, I, I guess another point I'll make before continuing on with the New York Times editorial here is uh, that they point up two Democrats currently standing in the way of it, Manchin and Cinema. they name. Um, and I think that's largely accurate. But... Uh, it should be pointed out that that wasn't always the case either, and that a significant number of Democrats who now say that they're interested, not only willing to go along, but interested in doing so, in changing the rules by simple majority vote, were not always reliable votes for it. Even in 2013, when they did it on the nominations and they had a, I think at that point, almost unified support from the Democratic caucus, there were definitely senators who said, well, OK, for this narrow thing, yes, but not for legislation. I don't support it for general legislation. And a lot of those senators have come around now to say, OK, well, at the very least for this particular kind of legislation, maybe for all legislation or definitely for this particular kind of legislation. And I wish for no other kind of legislation, but I know that those There'll be no drawing a logical line between this type of legislation and other types if Republicans, say, want to change where that line is drawn later on. But Pat Leahy, who says he'll do it, resisted for a long time. He came around in 2013, but he resisted that for a long time, too. Um, I think we made note of yesterday of Amy Klobuchar being on board as well. And she too was uh, unhappy with the idea, but, but compliant in the past, but unhappy with the idea of expanding it. And somewhere in pocket, I have someone's note about uh, Bernie Sanders saying that he was in support of uh, eliminating the filibuster to pass HR one and maybe some other things. And maybe it would be of some help in passing a minimum wage hike as well. But um, if I can find the tweet, it's, uh, is this one in here? Yeah, uh, it's the tweet of Eva McKend. I don't think I'm familiar with it, but she's the Spectrum News DC congressional correspondent. Uh, if that rings a bell for you, it doesn't for me, but she was retweeting Bernie Sanders' March 1st tweet saying, obviously, obviously, he says, as though this were always the case with him. Obviously, as soon as we can, we must end the filibuster that currently exists in the U.S. Senate. Given the enormous crises facing working families today, we cannot allow a minority of the Senate to obstruct what the vast majority of the American people want and need. That's, I think, true, and I think an obvious statement now uh, but as McKen points out, this is noteworthy because Senator Sanders has not always been at this place. He has been asked about the filibuster over the years and was previously unenthusiastic about getting rid of it. And that is true. Um, I recall it very well that he was one of the stragglers and uh, among that on that and a number of things, which I think uh, in hindsight, progressives who strongly identify with Bernie Sanders would have been surprised to find out 
about his opposition, not only uh, initially to say the elimination of the filibuster, but I can also state from personal experience his uh, opposition to impeaching George W. Bush for various reasons, either his support of the, what became the forever wars in Afghanistan and and or Iraq, take your pick, and uh, or uh, detainee policy or torture policy or uh, domestic surveillance policy, any number of things. But uh, all of them, he thought, were unwise to impeach George W. Bush for. It may have been the case politically, uh, and he may even have been right, but it would have surprised, I think, and still would surprise a number of his most progressive supporters. But uh, I, you know, w w I'm okay with that because I don't do the hero worship thing. And so even though I think that there are plenty of people who do, and in particular, sometimes with Bernie Sanders, uh, because I don't, I allow everybody the opportunity to back off and say, I support Bernie Sanders in 99.9% .9 of everything he says, but I disagree with him there on that one thing. And besides which, he's changed his mind on it since then anyway. So fine, I don't hold it against anybody. I just wanted to sort of point out that uh, that happens and uh, it, it, you know what? You could even point to that and say, look, Bernie Sanders being an incrementalist. Yeah, sure. Why not? If nothing else, it's evidence that he operates pretty much like everyone else. Uh, not that you shouldn't respect him as a result, but that uh, even people you think of as political heroes sometimes come slowly to these positions. So it's all right. Nobody should feel worried or offended by that. Anyway, now we can return, I think, safely to the New York Times piece here. Uh, where we left off was our surprise at how simply they state that the filibuster, because it's a Senate-created rule, can be changed by simple majority vote. Bipartisan cooperation and debate, they say, should be at the heart of the legislative process, but there's little evidence that the filibuster facilitates either. The filibuster doesn't require inter-party compromise. It requires 60 votes. It says nothing about the diversity of the coalition required to pass legislation. It just substitutes 60% of the Senate for 51% of the Senate as the threshold to pass most legislation. This is actually a good point. If the Senate was designed to be a place where both parties come together to deliberate and pass laws in the interest of the American people, the filibuster has turned it into the place where good legislation goes to die. By the way, there are rules imaginable that would force bipartisanship. I don't know if they're actually good rules, but the Senate has them now, but in a different context. There are plenty of committees that, I don't know whether they still retain these rules because Republicans were most recently in control of these committees and so probably changed the rules, but I know it was the case the last time Democrats prior to now controlled Senate committees that a lot of committees either retained this rule or reinstated this rule, having seen it eliminated under the previous Republican uh, control of committees. But there are several committees that require that at least some number of the membership of the minority in the committee, the minority party in the committee, vote in favor whether that's to report bills out or to vote to hold a hearing or to subpoena witnesses or what have you. Uh, that's definitely been the case. And some committees actually say things like, well, we need two members of the minority in order to go forward with this. And Republicans very frequently eliminated those rules because they got in the way of their doing what they wanted to do. And then when Democrats retook control, just like with the blue slips, they reinstated these rules about requiring bipartisanship. But anyway, despite the wisdom or lack of wisdom involved in, in those rules, the point is that there's a very explicit way to require bipartisanship. And the filibuster doesn't actually require it. If you had 60 Democrats in the House or 61 or in the Senate, had 61 Democrats, uh, the filibuster could exist all day long and it wouldn't require any bipartisanship whatsoever. If you want to require bipartisanship, make that the rule. I mean, I don't think it's a good rule, but you could do that. Don't just back into it with something as dumb as cloture rules. Anyway, almost time for our next break. We'll just continue on with the music in the background. 
That's one reason the framers of the Constitution didn't include a supermajority requirement for the Senate to pass legislation, that being that legislation goes there to die. They had watched how such a requirement under the Articles of Confederation had prevented the government from doing almost anything. As Alexander Hamilton wrote in Federalist 22, what at first sight might seem a remedy is in reality a poison. And look what happened to that guy. All right, maybe that's not the best example, but he's a famous dude. Hi everybody, it's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything. But if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the K-Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Ah, yes, okay. Uh, so let me continue on with the New York Times piece here. Uh, just uh, we left off uh, commenting snidely about Alexander Hamilton having uh, uh, opposed the idea of supermajority requirements. In particular, I guess he was talking about the supermajority requirement of the Articles of Legisl- of uh, Confederation. Supermajority requirements would serve, quote, to embarrass the administration, to destroy the energy of the government, and to substitute the pleasure, caprice, or artifices of a minority to the regular deliberations and decisions of a respectable majority. That's uh, flowery language, uh, but dead on, uh, and I'll divert from the story again, and this is what the, this is the fun of reading the newspaper uh, with us here on the show. Uh, if it was just me reading it to you straight, it would be of no value. You can read this for yourself. It's where my tangents take me. That makes it interesting to me, and I hope also to you, and I hope you read things the same way. Uh, just thinking about this, right? To uh, So uh, uh, Hamilton, supposing that supermajority requirements as opposed to requiring bipartisanship, which is the mansion cinema excuse for preserving the filibuster, and has been for a lot of people uh, all over the place, uh, both in and outside of Congress, who defend the filibuster. Uh, Rich Ehrenberg comes to mind, as a matter of fact, uh, in this. And, you know, I mean, I respect his opinion and everything, but I think he's wrong on this idea that the filibuster requires bipartisanship. I mean, in practice, because there's rarely 60 or 61 members of a single party in the Senate, uh, I guess it does. But one, if you want that rule, make it. And two, uh, yeah, it ends up discouraging bipartisanship because there's no point in being the 51st or 52nd vote for anything if you can't get to a vote on final passage to begin with. But uh, Hamilton's exactly right here in saying, okay, so what would end up being supermajority requirements would end up serving to embarrass the administration, destroy the energy of government, and to substitute the pleasure, caprice, or artifices of a minority to the regular deliberations and decisions of a respectable majority. What does that mean? Uh, among other things, I under, we understand why, how would it embarrass the administration? You would prevent the passage of a top priority and turn someone's campaign promise to deliver X, Y, and Z into a lie by preventing the passage of X, Y, Z, even when there's majority support for it. What about destroying the energy of government? Obviously, that's the part about where, uh, as the Times puts it, the filibuster is turned the Senate into the place where good legislation goes to die. These things are absolutely necessary. COVID relief, absolutely necessary, but absent the uh, accident of of reconciliation, couldn't have been passed because of the filibuster. I mean, absent are getting rid of it, right? So here, absolutely necessary that we do this thing. Cannot happen, though, uh, but for 
either the elimination of the filibuster or the happenstance of there being at least one way around it. But, you know, even so, the legislation has to be written in stupid and convoluted ways and good things that are also necessary can't be in it because of other stupid rules, which could just, you know, be voted on straight up minus the filibuster. There were other points that Hamilton was making. Uh, let's see. So that was the destroy the energy of government one. How about this one? To substitute the pleasure, caprice, or artifices of a minority uh, without the rest of the closing sentence there, uh, closing phrase, substitute the pleasure, caprice, or artifices. Artifices is easy enough. Pleasure or caprice. Well, okay. Uh, it's easy enough to imagine. Yeah, I won't let this go forward unless it's done my way or it includes my pet project or it doesn't include someone else's pet project because I hate them or whatever it may be. No public option allowed in the Affordable Care Act because I'm Joe Lieberman and I say something, something, something about it and I don't want that to happen. Uh, but what about those artifices? I just was thinking about a story we failed to take note of the other day, even though Bill uh, uh, hinted at it in his opening tweet, kicking off the show, and I forgot even to read that, and uh, I meant to get around to this, but how about this one here for artifices? Uh, Senator Mike Lee, widely quoted yesterday in the Twitter frenzy, um, saying of the For the People Act, H.R. 1, uh, which we described minutes ago. Was it in this? Was it in the uh, the New York Times piece? I think so. That they made mention of it, saying you know that this was key reform for the preservation. Here we are. House of Representatives passed HR one. The bill, as they say, a similar version of which passed the House in 2019, is a comprehensive and desperately needed set of reforms that would strengthen voting rights and election security. Ban partisan gerrymandering, reduce big money in politics, and establish ethics codes for the Supreme Court, the president, and other executive branch officials. It all sounds like pretty good stuff, right? Uh, and sure, there's room for disagreement uh, about these things, obviously, as there is about, about anything. But are they the sorts of disagreements, let's say, that would lead you to nod an agreement when an actual sitting senator who considers himself a libertarian uh, and a defender of the Constitution, et cetera, et cetera, has this to say about the For the People Act, H.R. 1, which the Times describes in such glowing terms, that not only does he oppose it, but that, quote, this is a bill as if written in hell by the devil himself. Now, you might guess that he's just trying to appeal to evangelicals or something like that. But what a thing to say about something that the Times describes as an absolute necessity for the continuance of our way of life and our democracy in this country. And a lot of people feel that way about it. And Lee says not only is that not the case, but it's as if this had been written in hell by the devil himself. Uh, wow. Wow. Pretty amazing. And as our Twitter friend Political Capital puts it, imagine learning about people getting more access to vote and coming to the conclusion that it's an idea written in hell by the devil. Uh, that is pretty amazing. And and I guess right up alongside it, uh, I saw yesterday Greg Sargent discussing the COVID relief bill in, and, and we have similar problems where all the senators, all Republican senators oppose it as if it was written in hell by the devil himself. And instead uh, are, uh, I guess here we're talking about the caprices and artifices invented by the minority. Greg Sargent commenting, Biden's bill could boost the income of the poorest fifth of Americans by 20%. We've mentioned this, right? Help millions save on health care and cut child poverty in half. Yet Republicans are off spinning wild tales about checks going to terrorists. They simply aren't part of the conversation, the real conversation taking place about how to govern. 
and pointing, of course, you know, as is warranted here to his own post about it, which expands on all of this. But the real meat of his objection is right there. Biden's bill, the American Rescue Plan, does all these great things. Republicans universally opposed to it in Congress. Anyway, even though half of Republicans support it, it does these great things. And what do they have to say about it? Well, what about the checks that go to terrorists? What about the checks going to illegal aliens? And they don't, but they say it anyway, as because they can and they can get away with it. And this, uh, they would have been able to stop it dead in its tracks, but for the existence of reconciliation offering us a way around the filibuster. Okay. So every point that Hamilton makes, I think, amply demonstrated this week, right before your very eyes, even though he wrote it 200 years ago. Continuing with the Times exposition here, the filibuster arose only decades later after uh, Hamilton wrote here. John Calhoun, a senator from South Carolina, used it as a means to protect the interests of slavers like himself from a majority. From its beginnings through the middle of the 20th century, when segregationists like Senator Strom Thurmond, also of South Carolina, kind of weird, used the filibuster to try to kill multiple civil rights bills, the pattern has been clear. It has been used regularly by those who reject inclusive democracy. The relevance of the history is that the pattern continues today. Finally, the filibuster is a redundancy in a system that already includes multiple veto points and counter-majoritarian tools, including a bicameral legislature, a Supreme Court, and a presidential veto. The Senate itself project protects minorities in its very design, which gives small states the same representation as large ones. Another common defense of the filibuster, as Ms. Cinema said, is that the filibuster is crucial for permitting full debate on a bill. Again, reality shows otherwise. The filibuster doesn't only fail to ensure extended debate on a bill, it today curtails the opportunity for any debate at all. A single senator can signal that he or she intends to filibuster by typing an email and hitting send. No need to stand on the Senate floor to make your impassioned case. That doesn't even get into the nitty gritty of it. The fact that you can filibuster the motion to proceed to a bill. Uh, the idea that you can filibuster, which is really supposed to be extended debate, that you can stop debate from starting is an absurdity. Reformers have suggested many ways to chip away at the filibuster without destroying it completely. One proposal would bar its use for legislation involving voting rights or other democratic expansions. And by the way, I've been hearing an email from our friend who contributed his series on the uh, American Rescue Plan, liberal thinking, has been doing some liberal thinking about just that sort of exception and, and uh, hopefully writing on it at Daily Coast. And perhaps at some point he hinted uh, adding some recorded segments on the subject for our use on the show here today. So again, one proposal would bar use of the filibuster for legislation involving voting rights or other democratic expansions. Uh, another would require the old-fashioned talking filibuster. A third would entail holding a series of cloture votes spaced three days apart, lowering the number of senators needed to end the filibuster each time. These are clever solutions, and Mr. Manchin has said he is open to at least one of them. And that's Good news, and I'm trying to decide whether we should just conclude this thing or we take another tangent. Let's conclude and see if we can come back and remember what our tangent was. But we, I've got some additional explanation, I guess, of one of the objections I raised earlier, uh, which is that it's not entirely clear that you could engineer the vote on a nuclear option style change to the cloture rules that would logically afford senators the opportunity to enshrine the um, use of the talking filibuster, for instance, or the uh, prohibition of the filibuster on votes involving uh, voting rights or anything of the sort. Since, you know, then you, I mean, that one, I think, is easily... Uh, 
well, you can worry about it in terms of look at the mess we've made of reconciliation and the Byrd rule and the decision that the parliamentarian has to make over whether or not, for instance, the minimum wage has enough budgetary impact to be included uh, in a reconciliation bill and coming to the conclusion that it doesn't, even though economists come to an opposite conclusion. Now you'll have, I guess, the parliamentarian trying to decide whether or not a bill substantially affects voting rights or not. And I imagine plenty of disagreement on those rulings in the future. But there are other more difficult uh, issues to consider. Let's move on, though, with what the Times has to say. Uh, where did we leave off? Uh, right. Uh, the, there were these uh, several proposals made, including talking filibuster, uh, voting rights bills, or the uh, series of cloture votes ratcheting down the threshold for cloture each time. That one they might be able to do uh, by nuclear option. Even if there were a real debate on a bill, however, it should end at some point. That was clear more than a century ago when the Senate had not yet established a rule to shut down a filibuster. As Henry Cabot Lodge, a Massachusetts senator, wrote, if the courtesy of unlimited debate is granted, it must carry with it the reciprocal courtesy of permitting a vote after due discussion. If this is not the case, the system is impossible. If the political reforms in H.R. 1 are not undertaken at the federal level, Republican leaders will continue to entrench minority rule. That's happening already in states like Wisconsin and North Carolina, where Republican-drawn maps give them large legislative majorities despite winning fewer votes statewide than Democrats. It's happening in dozens of other states that have passed hundreds of voting restrictions and are pushing hundreds more under the guise of protecting election security. The Supreme Court should be blocking these measures and protecting the right to vote, but far too often under Chief Justice John Roberts, it's done the opposite. In 2019, it refused to stop even the worst partisan gerrymanders. And in 2013, it struck down the heart of the Voting Rights Act, opening the door to a wave of Republican voter suppression laws that continues to crash. That's why federal law is the only solution. There have also been, already been, many revisions to the filibuster. In the 1970s, Congress created a loophole for spending and revenue bills to avoid the filibuster, allowing such legislation to pass with a simple majority, a process known as reconciliation. Yes, but also the budget, but okay. Uh, and that's what the, the legislation was, and that's where the loophole sits in the Budget Act, but everyone's focused on reconciliation. more, And I guess probably more properly so, because the budget itself actually, of course, is just a uh, concurrent resolution anyway and uh or is it a joint resolution that they use for that uh now i can't remember off the top of my head but anyway uh but has not got the force of law doesn't get sent to the president for signature and so therefore maybe a poorer example the fact is you can't filibuster it but then it doesn't make law anyway reconciliation does so better example more recently in 2013, Democrats eliminated the filibuster for nominations of lower court federal judges and executive branch officials. Four years later, Republicans eliminated it for Supreme Court justices, which allowed President Donald Trump to fill one third of the high court's bench with his picks, who are, of course, extraordinarily interested in of doing away with all of those voting rights protections that uh, you could otherwise depend on the Supreme Court for protecting. The perverse result of all of this is that it is now easier to block a piece of legislation which could be repealed in the next Congress than it is to block a federal judge seeking a lifetime appointment. Any intellectual justification for the filibuster has been gutted by the fact that it doesn't apply anymore to many important issues before the Senate. The point of H.R. 1 is not to help Democrats. It is to rebuild and reinforce the crumbling foundations of American self-government and abolish voter restrictions erected for explicitly partisan gain, a federal law that would protect all voters. If the choice is between saving the filibuster and saving democracy, it should be an easy call. And yet it's somehow not, for at least some Democratic senators, which is really kind of amazing. Uh, all right, let's see. I had uh, wanted to 
dive into a uh, somewhat complicated tangent, which I had a little discussion offline. Well, I mean, it was online, but offline in terms of being on the show uh, the other day. Uh, did I not put aside the uh, link to the email? Probably not, but maybe I can find it pretty quickly too. But I've been hinting for days and not really able to, I think, very clearly explain uh, why it might be difficult to use the nuclear option to set up something like a talking filibuster. You could, I think it would be very simple to do the ratcheting down of the cloture threshold via um, nuclear option. And so I, I guess perhaps the most likely outcome of a decision uh, that would ensue from getting all 50 Democratic and Democratic-leaning senators on board for making a change. I think that's the easiest option. Because again, remember the nuclear option procedure. You hold a cloture vote. I mean, maybe we have to remind everybody about this, right? They, they uh, In 2013, when they made this change, how did they do it? The mechanics of it was that there were nominations pending, and on one of the nominations that had to that point been filibustered, the Democrats under Harry Reid filed for cloture the normal way. And then when the cloture motion ripened a day plus after it was finally filed, uh, they brought it up for a vote and they held the vote and there were fewer than 60 votes in favor of cloture under the existing rules, at which point uh, Harry Reid made a, uh, a point of order. I don't remember exactly how uh, now that I think about it, how the mechanics went, but the point of order was made that a majority, simple majority, ought to be able to, uh, or it should be considered the case that a simple majority could invoke cloture on uh, the nomination that was there at that point pending. And indeed, for all nominations made by the president, for all of the executive branch and all of the judicial branch, save those appointments to the Supreme Court of the United States. And it was posited that way. And the chair said, well, no, that's not actually the way things work. And they, I guess, appealed the ruling of the chair and they found their 50 plus votes in favor of establishing this new precedent. I don't believe, I'd have to look back now, thinking about it, at the 2013 vote that they got, the they, that they required the Democratic senator in the chair to overrule the advice of the parliamentarian. They voted, or they ruled in concert with the parliamentarian. It was just, that's fine because the Democrats knew that they had the votes to overturn it, and that's the way they structured it. But anyway, uh, imagine you wanted to uh, impose instead the ratcheting down of the cloture threshold. You could certainly do that, and you could say, all right, even if there weren't 60 votes at the time, you could have done it this way, right? Um, well, I make the point of order that on the first motion for cloture, the threshold remains 60 votes, but that on the second motion for cloture on the same nomination, uh, if so long as it's made uh, at least three days subsequent to the failure of the first motion, that that motion should require only 55 votes and that a third motion should require only a simple majority, provided another three days passes. And you could have had the well, then at that point, the uh, senator in the chair would have said, that's not what the rules currently say. So, no, uh, the point of order is uh, is uh, not well taken, at which point the ruling of the chair would be appealed. And, uh, you know, the, the a Democratic majority would have voted and said, well, we we prefer that interpretation, even though it doesn't say that now. Uh so it's easy to see it setting up that way. Although, I guess now that I'm thinking it through, <clears throat> it is a little bit weird in that 
uh, it is, it still sets up a situation in which the person in the chair is being asked, doesn't the rule say this? And the, to read the simple rules and precedents say, no, it doesn't say that. And then you overrule it and say, well, we contend that it does, or at least that it should. And then voila, from that point forward, it does. Uh, but it's a more difficult situation to imagine in, I think, in imposing the talking filibuster. And here I'll rely on email that I exchanged with Adam Blomke, uh, uh, whose name I'm probably uh, mangling, even though I've uh, read it on the air before. Uh, uh, we, we may remember from years ago his blogging at NorthDecoder.com, which I don't think he still maintains at the moment. But we converse on things like the rules all the time. And he, uh, he wrote and asked, uh, hey, particularly since Manchin is showing an openness to returning to a talking filibuster, I started to think of how exactly would you go about changing that rule, particularly in the Senate. And now this is complicated, but I think he explained it fairly well. As I understand it, he says, the reason the painless filibuster, you know, the silent filibuster that we uh, that doesn't require the talking. The reason the painless filibuster exists is that when they brought down the threshold from two thirds to three fifths, right? 67 down to 60 votes happened in 1975. They changed it from, they counted the votes present and voting, changed it to counting senators chosen and sworn. And here it was valuable to have that parallel that Greg brought to our attention about the elimination of the, uh, what they then called the filibuster in the house right? That it was possible only because of a weird interpretation of how to count votes, right? People who were obviously present in the room, but who weren't answering their names when their, when the roll was called, were marked down as absent and not voting rather than present and not voting. So change the way you count things and poof, the outcome is totally different. Well, same thing here with the filibuster. Instead of counting, you need two-thirds to invoke cloture, but it's two-thirds of whoever shows up that day and actually votes versus, okay, now you only need three-fifths, but you need an affirmative three-fifths of all senators duly chosen and sworn, which means that in a Senate of 100, you got to find 60 votes no matter what the attendance situation is. So very true what Adam says here. Uh, the painless filibuster exists because when they change it from two-thirds to three-fifths, they change the standard of counting from present and voting to chosen and sworn, requiring that the majority produce the votes to end debate. Well, it struck me, as I thought about how this was done, that you would need to create a circumstance in order to make this stuff logical. You would need to create a circumstance where that distinction would matter in order to get people to vote to change it, right? And so you would need to have a vote where 50 senators constituted three-fifths of the senators present and voting in order for your situation to make logical sense. And then make a point of order that, well, uh, because three-fifths of the senators present and voting say that cloture has been invoked. Only 30 hours of debate now remain according to rule 22 and we need to go forward. You get it? What he's saying here? It seems to me, he says that it would be a hard hill to climb. No, even if Schumer pulled a fast one and reconvened on a moment's notice in the middle of a recess, he'd have a hard time filing a cloture motion in time and bringing it up in such a way that it wouldn't give Republican senators enough notice to get their butts back to DC given the day's worth of lag time required by the rules. In other words, you'd also probably have to throw out the rule about how long it takes to ripen a cloture motion, which might not be a bad idea to do alongside this other one. But in order for it to make any sense to say, well, we want to change the way votes are counted from present, uh, from uh, uh, chosen and sworn to present and voting, you could always make that motion, but then they would say to you, well, okay, that might be the way we want to interpret it from here on in. But right now, you're still going to lose on your appeal because there aren't three-fifths of the Senate here voting to end debate. 
so it makes it rather tough. Now, uh, you might be able to do it with regular order rules change, but that too would require 67 votes. You might be able to do it at the beginning of a brand new Congress when you could suspend, arguably, the 67 vote requirement. But can you do it in the middle of a session? Well, it would require a much less logical request than simply saying, well, doesn't the rule from this point forward say that only 51 senators are necessary? Because we do have 51. But if you were proposing a point of order that says, well, three-fifths of those present and voting should be able to do it, and therefore we invoke cloture, the chair would say, you might even be right in a few minutes about what the rule should say, but you're not even meeting that rule now unless you had this very weird situation that Adam describes. From NetworksRadio.com, you have been listening to Kegro in the Morning with David Waldman. All right, one last closing thought on I guess you could say that you set this vote and point of order up ahead of the really critical one and say, well, next time it should only be those present and voting and lose the current vote. Maybe you'd be willing to do that. All right, we'll get back to this tomorrow, I'm sure, if being Friday. Now, Justice Putnam making more sense next.